It's an urgent alert. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today in our show today. It's time to get out now as the banks have started dumping everything. And if you own any of these asset classes, I'm going to make the case of why you need to take a look at selling them now before you can't. I'll show you what the banks have started selling and the reason behind it and why it's only a matter of months before they're selling everything. Plus, we have a sponsor for today's show. I'd like to welcome Safe Supply to the show. You can find them on the CSC under symbol SPLY and on the OTCQB under symbol SSPLF. And they're a venture capitalist firm building a diversified portfolio of companies and merger and acquisition targets focused on the safe supply of drugs and in the AI-powered healthcare space. And if you've been looking to make an investment in this area, safe supplies, your one simple answer. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now let's over to Bloomberg where he picked today's story up with a headline is PIMCO warns of more U.S. regional bank failures on property pain. And this is something that we have said was coming. We go back to March of last year and what did we see of urgency of banks starting to fail. We actually saw a few of them go down. The Fed and other agencies rushed in and said, this is the end, it won't happen anymore. We made the case of why that was only the beginning and now PIMCO is sounding the alarm that more banks are failing and as a result, they're looking to dump assets and it's already begun. As Pacific Investment Management expects more regional bank failures in the U.S. because of, quote, very high concentration of troubled commercial real estate loans on their books. And this is something if you own commercial real estate in your portfolio somewhere and you have to dig deep, look in your 401k, look in your large managed IRAs and see if you have commercial real estate holdings because odds are you do. What you're about to find out, you might want to start to get rid of it as the real wave of distress is just starting for lenders to everything from malls to offices. This is from John Murray, PIMCO's head of global private commercial real estate team. His division manages $173 billion of alternate business. And uncertainty over when the Federal Reserve may cut interest rates has exasperated challenges faced by the commercial real estate sector where high borrowing costs have hammered valuations and triggered defaults. And that's only part of the story because in yesterday's show, we talked about how it's going to be chaos tomorrow when the CPI comes out, when we eventually get the Fed press conference. We know Know they're likely to hold rates. We know the consumer price index probably isn't going to drop substantially, maybe even go up slightly. And this is going to cause pandemonium because what you're seeing in the commercial real estate space is it's starting to fracture. The banks are starting to realize their exposure to this asset class is getting in a dangerous situation, forcing them to liquidate. Why? Because they need money. And this is, of course, they know that leaving lenders stuck with assets that are tough to sell. And this is the key part because we've talked about how landlords, people who own these buildings and have a finance to the hill are going to just turn the keys back over to the banks. The banks are gonna to have to write them down, take a huge loss. They're in absolutely no position to do that. As contrary to submarket expectations, larger banks have been disposing of some of their higher quality assets first to avoid deeper losses. Now, this is very interesting that we see banks selling off what you would perceive as assets they would want to keep, these high quality assets. And you start to think about why they would do that. Again, they need cash. I'm gonna show you specifically why the banks are so desperate for cash and they have to sell what they can sell because they've got a whole loan book of stuff. Well, they can't. And this is what's coming. This happened in the news yesterday. A New York City office building will sell at such a discount. It's 67% below the purchase price and less than what's still owed on the mortgage. Can you imagine if buildings all around the country start trading at a third of their current price? This means there's going to be a long list of regional bank failures. And it's simply a matter of looking at how much commercial real estate exposure they have because the more of it they have, 
the more likely they're gonna be insolvent. And the deal was a short sale, meaning that related as lenders, including Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, agreed to sell the property for less than the outstanding amount on the mortgage, meaning somebody is going to lose money. It's gonna likely be the bank, as a loan balance for the tower was more than 100 million, one of the people said. Short sales have become more common in the office sector as values have fallen below loan amounts. Now you think back, when was the last time we saw lots of short sales? Well, that was falling the global financial crisis, when people were upside down in their homes, they were losing their jobs and needed to sell them. Now we haven't even seen a huge wave of layoffs, but we're already seeing this hit the commercial real estate space. This is just the beginning. And remember, you may not just be holding commercial real estate property. It could be bonds. It could be in the form of a REIT. If you own it, you gotta watch out when this dries up, there's gonna be no exit plan as office properties across the u.s have seen valuations plummet as borrowing costs rose and demand wavered with the rise of remote work the market largely froze up over the last two years as lenders and owners struggled to agree on pricing holding on to assets instead of being forced to sell at fire sell prices which we know will come during the next recession but looming maturities and rising costs are starting to push more owners to cut their losses Banks, who often don't want to take over managing offices' buildings because it's not their business model, are also incentivized to work with landlords on deals to find buyers for the properties, including short sales, meaning it's cheaper for them just to take the loss on a short sale than it is to take over a building that they have no clue how to manage. And what we're seeing now is stress loans are growing due to maturities. However, we expect that banks, this from PIMCO, will start selling these more challenged loans to reduce their trouble loan exposure. So right now they're trying to raise cash. I'll show you why they're so desperate to get cash. But at some point, they're going to be forced to sell some of these distressed assets. And why? Because the cash they need won't be enough from selling their good assets. And here we can see, of course, PIMCO snapping up some CRE loans offloaded by large U.S. banks over the past month. The turmoil has been particularly felt among regional banks, which we've noted are going to have massive liquidity crises. In fact, coming out of March of last year, they did not resolve the issues. The Fed simply wallpapered over this. We know there's rot underneath it. I'll show you exactly where that is. And why the pain is coming and here we can see that now many of those banks have commercial real estate exposure that is only worth a fraction of their value at the peak and smaller banks have continued to worry investors since the collapse of a few last year Earlier this year, U.S. Bank Corp, the largest regional bank by assets, increased its provisions for credit losses in the first quarter to $553 million. If you don't know what a provision for credit losses, is, think of that as money they're setting aside to pay, of course, losses on loans that they issued. And let's talk about the reason why this is happening. If we look at what the Federal Reserve did, and they raised short-term rates higher than market expectations, and when that happens, you get an inversion of what's called the yield curve. Now, in red we're looking at the two-year tenure and this is where you take the 10-year yield and subtract the two-year yield and anytime it's underneath that horizontal black line what it's suggesting is the curve is indeed inverted meaning the fed has pushed up those again those short-term rates higher than the market would price them at and when that happens because banks lend at the borrow at the short end of the curve and let it the long end of the curve, well, they don't make money on the interest rate spread. And what you see here is the net percentage of domestic banks tightening lending standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes in blue. Anytime that's over that horizontal block line, on net banks are tightening standards because it makes sense. If they can't make money lending, they're not going to lend as much. And when they do that, they curtail the amount of money created in the economy because commercial banks are the only institutions that can create money money in our debt-based economy. The government can't just the commercial banks when they lend. And so as they curtail lending, there isn't enough money in the economy. And then what happens next is delinquency rates start to rise. And here we're seeing this is quarterly data. So we don't have the most recent data because it's not out yet. But what we can indicate here is a delinquency rate as banks tighten lending standards, they curtail the creation of credit and money into the system. Well, there isn't enough money for everyone to pay on their debts. That's why you see delinquencies rise as banks tighten lending standards 
containers. We can only expect the next data series to show a huge increase in that. Of course, we've noted that consumers in the credit card space and the buy now pay later loans are already entering delinquency as they're missing payments. We've noted that some commercial properties are also seeing rising delinquency rates. It's all because of the Fed. And here you can see why the banks are having an issue with cash. It all comes back to the bank term funding program. And this is that program where the Fed lent money to the banks in exchange for a swap of assets. The problem is the banks need to pay this back. And the whole hope was the banks were gonna originate enough new loans, start bringing deposits in, have money to pay it back. And now they're facing a problem. The Fed has canceled this program, it's over. And the maturity on these loans well, was only one year. So the banks have to pay a lot of money back. And you can see it's going to happen in the near term future. The banks desperately need cash and they need it now as regional banks were also the only lenders that didn't demand extra down payments from commercial property borrowers in recent in years so you think back to the global financial crisis you think back to the housing market and how did this happen property values went up people borrowed against them not just in first mortgages but they took second mortgages they had all these loans where you didn't have to put money down and people borrowed every bit of that property because the belief was they could only go up and in the commercial real estate space that's the belief too so in order to get these loans bank says you don't need a down payment well now the values are plummeting the banks have no margin for error and of course we know that people who own the buildings are looking to walk away and this is highlighting their vulnerability you talk about the risk to these regional banks is falling values. Deposit taking institutions face an estimated 441 billion wall of maturing property debt this year of which they have absolutely no answer to. And for larger banks, the property exposures aren't expected to cause systematic failures as their CRE lending was curbed after the 2008 crisis. Now, we do know that this is true with the large banks, but what did the large banks do? And we talked about this in the show the other day. They extended credit lines to a lot of these real estate investment trusts and other institutions, giving themselves exposure that nobody really knows they have. But borrowers' failure to repay means they're lending even less compared to 2021 and 2022. And meanwhile, many mortgage real estate investment trusts have become more sidelines as they deal with problems on their own, suggesting, again, if you own that asset class, it's really time to take a hard look at getting out while you still can. There will be a point where they freeze withdrawals, wait and see, because banks tend to hog most of the headlines. Another area that needs close attention is the more than $200 billion of loans made by debt funds in the U.S., they're set to mature through 2025. Many of these loans were originated during the peak pricing era of 2021, often with a three-year term and a three-year rate cap, meaning the rate's gonna go up in a big way, and along with the payment at a time when the system is already short of money, we're going to see even more delinquencies. And we can look at you know, why the Fed is going to cut rates here. We talk about how the Fed is moved short-term rates higher than what the market expects, and that is the yield curve here, now shown in blue against the federal funds rate. And so when you see these inversions in the yield curve, as we're highlighted here, you'll note that at some point the Fed drops rates because what happens is the economy starts to enter either a recession or like we saw during 2008-9, an all-out financial crisis is going to force the Fed to cut in a big way. Question is, what do you think? Are we gonna achieve the no landing, soft landing scenario the Fed hopes for, a recession? or maybe something worse. Weigh in the comments. Love to know what you think as the first catalyst for stress at the asset level is occurring right now as assets will struggle to meet extension tests in this high rate environment, forcing prices to come down in a big way. And it's not just the U.S., PIMCO notes that they're watching German banks and how they deal with their commercial real estate exposure as well. This is something we're seeing all over the world. And at a time now when consumers are starting to tap out and hit a wall, and this is starting to show up as small businesses have now noted something very strange has happened as the small business uncertainty index reaches the highest level since 2020, suggesting the small businesses aren't as optimistic as they 
thought. And while the optimism index reached the highest reading of the year at 90.5, the uncertainty index rose nine points to 85, the highest reading since November of 2020. 22% of owners reported inflation was their single most important problem in operating their business. And this is important because small businesses are responsible for the production of over 40% of GDP. And looking at the monthly jobs report from the NFIB, a seasonally adjusted net 18% plan to raise compensation in the next three months, down three points from April and the lowest reading since March of 2021. And we're talking about how decelerating wage growth is going to lead to less spending while well, small business owners are starting to say, we're not going to be doling out the raises like we used to. We just can't do that anymore. And here's why. Because a net negative, 14% of all owners reported higher nominal sales in the past three months, suggesting that, again, problems with demand. A net percent of owners expecting higher real sales volumes fell one point to a net negative 13%. So at a time, they have to give out wage increases Increases, and now they're going to give out smaller ones while well, they're seeing their sales decline. This is exactly what we've noted was going to happen. And price hikes were the most frequent in retail, 55% higher finance, 50% higher construction, 42% higher, suggesting that they're going to continue to try to raise prices in that 28% plan to raise high hikes in May. The problem is demand is falling. They need to pay their employees more that the issue is going to be not for much longer because the layoffs are going to start and demand for employees is going to plummet in a big way. And the frequency of the reports of positive profit trends was a net negative 30%. So again, you see they're not making money here. Three points worse than April and a very poor reading among owners reporting lower profits, 32%. This is key. Blame weaker sales as demand and fell and this is dangerous for of course the economy and for the banks because we know the small business owners well they tend to have loans too and so you can look at how the banks are going to be act impacted from commercial real estate real estate investment trusts small businesses and even consumers there's going to be no question of why we're going to see a large number of banks failing but one company is looking for successful companies to invest in in the safe supply of drugs and ai powered healthcare. that safe supply or sponsor of today's show if you're looking to invest in this space we'll look no further than the csc under the symbol sply and on the otcqb under the symbol ssplf everything in the pinned comment and description below because they're looking to invest in a new beginning led by pioneers in the cannabis and psychedelics industry safe supply is the first venture capital firm investing in the burgeoning safe supply ecosystem the third wave of drug reform and an end to the war on drugs and their strategy is to invest in and incubate companies across the safe supply ecosystem to create a tightly woven fabric of synergies that generate short-term revenues to safe supply while also maximizing value accreditation as our investee companies grow. And their pioneers in this industry are leading safe supply. Here you can see Bill, David, and Seti, and their experience is, of course, top notch and their portfolio right now includes canna labs and safe supply licensing companies and the leadership team has developed a proprietary pipeline of early stage companies that have strong management teams and well-designed business strategies to play a pivotal role in this space which they expect to execute investments over the next six to 12 months and what their goal is to build a portfolio of diversified assets and smartest way to invest in the emerging safe supply ecosystem and the third wave of drug reform is is through building a diversified portfolio led by a world-class team. And that is, again, Safe Supply on the CSC under symbol SPLY and on the OTCQB under the symbol SSPLF. And here you can see they just announced a strategic expansion into AI-powered healthcare solutions as they're looking to include advancements in mental health, addiction treatment, and safe supply methodologies as part of their portfolio. And they've spent the last two years building a proprietary pipeline of m and targets. The company intends to explore transaction structures, partnerships, and says total addressable markets that provide the most accredited revenue opportunities in the short term within a legal framework of safe supply. The company has concluded that medical testing and technology-driven solutions around mental health, canceling, addiction, 
and harm reduction testing provide the most attractive strategic opportunities for the third wave because our space has a compound annual growth rate expectation of six and a half percent and you can get in on that third wave with safe supply on the CSE again on the symbol SPLY on the OTCQB under symbol SSPLF and here you can see at three cents a share it is a very low entry point to get exposure into this third wave and as always with any company we feature on this show you're under no obligation to purchase their stock be sure to do your own research before placing any trades and with that i'm steve van meter thanks for watching thanks for being fans bye now